Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Houston. We have a problem. I got a special guest today. Ron Erickson, the chairman and CEO of No Labs, is going to talk to us about, well, tech, stock shorting, you name it. Uh, we're going to try and cover everything. Um, and so, uh, uh, yeah. And, and I'm sure we're going to touch on the news of the day, which is uh, uh, Silicon Valley Bank imploding, getting seized by FDIC. Uh, here's the interesting fact before I click the intro. If you had invested $1,000 into $220 puts on Wednesday for, 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 for Silicon Valley Bank, by Thursday afternoon, you would have made $11.8 million. <laughs> So that is one one million one hundred thousand eighty thousand percent uh gains in one trading wow. day. Yeah. That's ridiculous. And if they had allowed trading today, I it would have been even more, it probably would have been close to two million percent gains in two days. But uh yeah, so all right, here we go. Here's here's our intro. A few seconds of that. Okay. And the thing is, I always forget to turn off the intro, but I remember to turn it off. And that way, if I change screens, it doesn't pop back up again. All right. Welcome, Ron. Uh, so disclaimers, you, uh, disclaimers off the bat. Ron and I have known each other for years. I'm friends with his daughter yep. who just had a baby this week. Little Owen. Yes. Um, yep. uh, I've, I've toured new labs with him. He's explained the tech to me and I've signed an NDA. So I, I'm not allowed to explain the tech, but if Ron wants to reveal anything, he's, you know, it's his thing. Uh, but I, I had originally planned right before COVID of doing a PhD through South Queensland University in Australia, utilizing the tech uh, for identifying minerals. And uh, but then COVID hit and it ruined everything. So I didn't do that program. Um, but uh, last week, uh, someone called White Diamond Research, right? White Diamond Capital, White Diamond Research, uh, released a sort of a hit piece on No Labs. And the stock price just plummeted. And it was an obvious short attack. Uh, a lot of half-truths and misdirections were in the research. So I thought I'd bring Ron on. And uh, we can discuss sort of his background, the background of No Labs, the tech uh, behind it, um, the where it can go, and uh, you know whatever else we have to touch on today. So, Ron, welcome. Yeah. Um, well, Houston, Houston, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, it's great to see you. You know, I had to yeah. tell people that I think the last time I saw you was in the ferry parking lot in Seattle on our way to Bainbridge Island, where we both live. And I pulled in behind Houston. Houston was in a Corvette and I was in a Corvette. So I mean, that says something about us. We, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and, and I got out and said, my God, Houston, it's you. What are you doing here? And so and uh, yeah, so we yeah. we both have a have a we, we both are gearheads yeah Ron, ron's a big time classic car racer races a 58 corvette 57 57 fuel injected 57 fuel yeah. and then i've i've got a couple of uh vintage 911s i race too yeah. so yeah, yeah, i've been yeah. for, for, fortunate to be able to scratch that car itch and yeah yeah i i buy i buy uh uh junkers that explode on me constantly so <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's well, my, one of the yeah. things I, I know, Houston, is sometimes they don't explode. Sometimes you, you've you have had some uh, mishaps when you've been out and about. Yes, I do roll them. Also, yes, <laughs> yes, I know. I, I'm aware of that. I'm aware of that. I've seen I've seen photographic evidence. <laughs> yes. All right. So let's get to the nitty gritty. Um, uh, uh, no labs. Its main thing that's researching and working on is a non-invasive glucose monitor, right? Yeah, and yeah. and there's there's a few companies out there that have announced that they're also working on these things, uh, yeah. but you've got some particular proprietary proprietary tech, and you've already done your first round of human trials, right? Well, we're I'd say it, we don't. This is not like a therapeutic where you do various rounds. We're mm -hmm. doing continuing continuing testing. Okay, continuing testing. We don't even we don't refer to rounds, but continuing okay. testing as we uh, work on refining our algorithms, refining our our various analytics. Uh, so it, it, what we have, and I, you know, Houston and I've talked about this at some length historically is we've developed a uh, sensor technology util utilizing radio frequency, radio frequency spectroscopy. And what we do is we send energy into, in this, in, into the body. 
uh, modest amounts of energy, and it's been tested, so it's you know it's non-harmful levels. Yeah. It's le- less than your cell phone. We send it, uh, send energy, and then we uh, from a sending antenna, and then we receive the energy back. And there's a delta between the sent and received energy, and we know the frequency we're sending it at, and uh, that allows us to identify the presence of analytes in the human body, and that not just the presence, but the amount. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, sort of th- thinking about this in really kind of basic terms, every analyte in the human body, every molecule has unique frequency at which it will resonate or excite. And so uh, it's a platform technology, this radio frequency driven sensor technology of ours. And we re- literally have a list of about 100 analytes that over time we hope to be able to identify in the human body. But our first focus <clears throat> is on glucose. And you know, when you're when you're when you have a platform technology, you know, a platform it has certain strengths, but it has certain weaknesses. And the uh, one of the weaknesses is you have so many choices. What do you go for first if you've got a platform? Where are you going to focus your attention? Yeah. Um, but you know, you've got a multiplicity of opportunities. It, in our case, as we started to think about what to do with this platform technology. Clearly, blood glucose is significant. Uh, people are saying that that the onset of a, adult diabetes is pandemic in the world. There are about yeah. 500 people that suffer from diabetes in the world. And and then there's maybe two and a half to three times that many pre-diabetics. So you've got a big addressable market. Everybody in business likes big addressable yep. markets. And then I think really fundamentally, it, there's a, I mean, I hate to even use the term, but there's a pain point. You know, if 15 million people in America are pricking their finger every day, and they're doing that an average of three times, four times, and every finger stick costs a buck, you yep. get them in bags of 100, it's a big deal. I mean, you're looking at 45 to $60 million a day a finger stick. Yeah. And, you know, so big pain point. Uh, there are a lot of people that, especially a pre-diabetic, they don't want to prick their finger or they're not going to get insurance for a Dexcom or an Abilabs Freestyle Libra. So yeah. we see a, a non-invasive solution, an inexpensive, relatively speaking, inexpensive solution that can give quality information about your blood glucose levels, we think is going to make a big difference yeah. for people, not just people with diabetes, but people with pre-diabetes. And, and that's sort of step one. Uh, that's the first focus. But then over time, <laughs> following on behind that, uh, we want to be ad- identifying additional analytes. We we have publicly indicated that we've successfully done blood alcohol as mm-hmm. compared to a state-of-the-art breathalyzer. We've publicly indicated that we've uh, done uh, blood oxygen levels. And that's very fascinating to me, and I'll explain that more in a minute. Um, and, and blood oxygen levels that are comparable to hospital uh, quality pulse oximeters. Okay. Um, so, and then we've also uh, had people in our lab take Tylenol or, or aspirin, and we can see when it hits the bloodstream and what its half life looks like. And so, those are, uh, you know, th- those are proxies for other therapeutics that yeah. you could know if your grandmother was taking her meds, for example, or whatever the case, <laughs> case may be. So uh, we're really excited about what we're doing. And and I think the driver, you know, f- for me, uh, uh, I really feel this, you know, compulsion to make a difference. That's really yeah. what we're, we're working hard to make a difference. Because we think this, as we come to market uh, post FDA clearance, we're going to be able to make a significant difference in people's lives. Yeah, and if, you, that, if so, you've got, you know, tens of millions of Americans alone, not just counting people around the world that no one got to prick their fingers anymore. You know, the, the, the finger strip, uh, business is going to be like the wagon wheel makers. They're just going (laughs) to fade away. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, that's, that's our hope. And, and, uh, then as you know, we, we identify these other analysts, I mentioned oxygen and I said, that was intriguing to me. Uh, what's intriguing to me about that is, there were hearings last November one, and the FDA had around uh, blood oxygen pulse oximeters, and and this is something that arose in the COVID context. People began to develop an awareness that uh, photonic-based pulse oximetry uh, had some uh, some issues in terms of accuracy when there were high levels of melanin, dark okay. skin. Yeah, yeah, right. 
I mean, it's it's logical, right? That you know, if you've got something that's photonic based, it might have some issues with penetration. Yep. And I'll just say that radio frequency has none of those issues, right? Yeah. I mean, it. it I want to say it's like your garage door opener doesn't care if there's a garage door between you and the opener, yeah, yeah. right? I mean, it. And so similarly, radio frequency. Uh, is not inhibited by uh, by melanin levels. And it, it turns out that in the COVID context, there were people with high levels of melanin that had their diagnostics delayed because they were getting inexact readings. And that's what that FDA, the FDA hearing yeah. in November 1 addressed. So basically they got, they got worse care as a result. They got worse care. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I, I think that that's just another application of our platform technology, right? And all of this, <clears> by the way, supported by uh, now in excess of 100 patents pending and issued. We yeah. give a lot a lot of care to the patent portfolio and uh, you know it uh, that's that ends up being a really increasingly valuable asset of ours. So Excellent. yeah so, we're excited. Uh, yeah, I mean the, I could say you know uh, I, I watched the, fun. the the video on your first uh, series of tests you were doing, and it looked like people had there's a sensor in their armrests, and they would put their arms on the armrests, and it would measure, and then they would prick their fingers and calibrate the system. Yeah. Right, that's kind of what you're doing. Well, we were not we were not using the the finger stick. We we were this was just we were comparing uh, the results out of the the sensors under your arms. Mm -hmm. They're comparing those results to the results from the finger stick. Okay, yeah, that, not calibration. Okay, it was really, okay. It, we were you know comparing, and then you know those same same individuals doing testing, uh, maybe wearing a Dexcom on their stomach stomach yeah. a, a, a Dexcom G six, or they may be wearing an Abbott Labs freestyle. And those 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 are the pumps, right? Uh, or, no, or no, those the measure are, the, the these are these are devices. By the way. Dexcom G6 from Dexcom and Abbott Labs Freestyle Lab, uh, uh, Freestyle Libra from Abbott Labs. These are what they both companies call minimally invasive continuous glucose monitors. Minimally mm -hmm. invasive, so they have to be replaced every ten days to two weeks. They have a needle that goes and a, 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 an adhesive that attaches to your body and a needle that goes into the interstitial fluid. Mm. Um. I say minimally invasive because it's a needle. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's still, right? still like but, poking a hole in your body. Yeah, right. But what? Uh, yeah, you're, it's all about marketing. Yeah. They don't call it a needle, uh, Houston. It's called a filament. Okay, all right. You know, a like filament a doesn't. Yeah, yeah. A, fil <laughs> a filament doesn't sound nearly as invasive. But so at any rate, uh, so are people are testing in our lab. They will. Uh, they, they might have one of those as well. So they might be doing finger stick. And they'd wear a Dexcom, yeah, because we're 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 testing against uh, uh, standards in the industry. Yeah. Um, so, like, ultimately, your device would be sort of, I guess, like a bracelet, or kind of like a Fitbit well, type thing, or would you put well, it into other people's tech, or so. Uh, yes, yes, and yes. Okay. Right? <laughs> so, um, I think that you know. So if you've got a sensor technology and, you know, you take care of miniaturization, I think it's a kind of technology that could, uh, it's form factor agnostic, right? right? So it could find its way into all kinds of devices. Okay. Right. Um, and, and one of those could be uh, something that was a wearable. Yeah. Um, when we were doing SpO2, interesting, we were testing oxygen. We did tests on, and we put our device 11 different places on a person's body, on one of the tester's bodies, and we got accurate results every place. Yeah. And really the point of that, I used to, I would joke and I'd say, well, this could be in your tennis shoe, all right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, so uh, I think that, you know, a wearable is for somebody that needs continuous information. Um and and then you know we can also have a device. One of the devices we've been talking about is for what I'd call more episodic use. So the person who's pricking their finger three or four times a day doesn't necessarily need to wear something, yeah. but they want to be able to test non-invasively. So they just go boop and check themselves. Go yeah, yeah but yes, you got it. Check themselves yeah. and uh, and that that is something they could you know have in their purse or their pocket or whatever, and yeah. you know give them the same kind of. You know, give them access to information. It would uh, connect via Bluetooth to a smartphone device, and you know, have an app, and yeah, yeah. they'd have all the have the information without having to prick their finger, and sort of on the go, yeah. on the go. Yeah, cool. Um, 
Yeah, no. So we're we're, we're making great progress. Very excited about it, and uh, we've got. You know, the big things we're working on this year, and we've announced all this, is, you know, working on validation, third-party validation. That's key. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, I, I think one of the things, there's always a lot of cynicism around people doing something like this. A lot of people have tried non-invasive yeah. blood glucose monitoring, and they failed. There have been people that call this the holy grail. I mean, yeah. if you're able to do this, it's a very big deal. So I think there's a lot of cynicism. We deal with that. Um, uh, you know, in the lab, I mean, in our bunker, we know it works. We see yeah. it work, right? And so one of the things we work on this year is working on third-party validation so that people can, the third parties who are trusted um, can validate it. And then uh, working on, uh, uh, I mentioned form factor agnostic, but when you go to the FDA, the FDA clearance, it has to take a form. Yeah. And it, ha and it has to take the form that you're going to take to market. And so it's got to look exactly like it's got to work like the thing that's going to take to market. Yeah. So we we'll work on uh, on on that. Every day we're using the sensor. The sensor is fully baked, but it's it's not yet in that pretty form factor you yeah, go to yeah. market. And so you know we got these various things we're working on this year, and we'll be making announcements over the course of the year that that are evidence of uh, serious progress. So do you, we're excited about it. Do you have like a, a nebulous timeline as to when you can hope no. to have FDA no. go? No, yeah. no, no, <laughs> no. And the reason, okay. the reason for that, let me tell you one of the things. I mean, I think we're all sort of, I've been chastened by COVID, post-COVID supply chain. Yeah. Right. And, Whenever you're dealing with third parties, I mean, I think that really sort of, the, you know, what's the bottom line? I mean, I could say, geez, the things that we can control, and I try to really work hard on managing expectations, we can control, you know, we, we, we try to stay on time with the things that we can control. But if I'm dealing with third parties, it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. And then you throw in that mix, you know, we had COVID out of left field, but then, you know, sort of associated supply chain things. And I'm just, I had an interesting conversation with a serious manufacturer, um, Singapore-based, who said they've really been having a difficult time with chips. Yeah. And, and what happened, I mean, I think we all live in this, you know, I mean, you and I car guys, you know, the, yeah. the automobile manufacturers were really delayed because they couldn't get yeah, chips. They couldn't right? semiconductors. Yeah, they're all, they're all, they've, they, none of them were coming. Yeah. Yeah. So what this, this, uh, uh, business colleague of mine out of Singapore said to me within the last couple of weeks, he said, you know, all the big chip guys, they're just making chips for the automobile manufacturers now. In other yeah. words, if I want to do a small, you know, it's just so, you know, what is it? The law of unintended consequences? Yeah. Yeah. Right? And, and you know, until the U.S. ramps up its own chip production, which is what the infrastructure bill had in it, uh, yeah. you know, the B Biden made this... Um, uh, I don't know what to call it. It's not a tariff embargo. Uh, but he, he said, if you're an American working in the semiconductor industry in China, you're going to lose your citizenship. <laughs> and so everybody who had green cards, citizenship, whatever, they all left China. And China now, their production of semiconductors has just plummeted uh, because they don't have the people who know how to use the machines there anymore. And it was those American-trained um uh, uh, scientists and engineers who are operating these really in intensive, specific billion dollar oh, yeah. machines that stamp out these semiconductors. So, no, a, yeah. Yeah. So, no, so, so I mean, that's yeah. that. So, you know, <clears throat> as we begin to, well, I'll just say in terms of the productizing, getting to that form factor. Yeah. And as you can imagine, inside a device it's got a lot of pieces yep. parts and it's got a battery and it's got this and it's got that that uh you know as you go out to the supply chain you you're you sometimes have to say well golly so that one there are some some chips now that are a year out houston yep a year a year out right <laughs> yeah now not for with that 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 just happens because we've been you know we go out and we're you know, we know people and we're talking to people that is uh, those that are year out. We don't need those, but there are, we, I, I know people that do need them and are saying, you know, what am I going to do? Yeah. I got it. I'm, I'm a year out. 
I'm right. supposed to release this particular Apple Watch or whatever, and you, you, you whatever the thing yeah. is. But so I, um, and that that you know, it's um, there's not much you can do about that. <laughs> yeah, it's, you kind of just at the mercy of 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 that global supply chain, and you just kind of throw up your hands yeah. and twiddle your thumbs, and yeah, no, yeah. I think it's again, you know, I mean, you know. Houston, did we we went through a point here, and I it was pretty crazy. You probably saw it, and I saw it too. I think at one point, didn't we have like um, twenty two cargo ships in the in the bay out here in Seattle? Oh yeah, to, yeah. Everyone on uh, the south I'm, end of the island was complaining because their entire like beach was just full of diesel fumes, and because they're just sitting uh, there no, waiting. That, and yeah. the generators going twenty four seven out there. It was you know et cetera, but that's I think that's we've kind of we've kind of moved beyond that yeah. now a bit, but you know, at any rate, yeah. Third parties. We can't, I, I, <laughs> I can control my timelines. I can't control these external timelines. Yeah, so yeah. I, I've just, I've just gotten past it. I'll just say we're in a hurry. Yeah. To, hurry, we're in a hurry to, we're, we're moving as fast as we can. Yeah. And you, and you know, you, there's quite a few companies that have announced that they're, that they have their own, versions that they're working on famously apple announced that they're going to try and incorporate one well right? yeah but say, that was i'm going to call that that was that was old news yeah right that was old news um and uh i i think that they that announcement it was published in bloomberg i think yeah. they, i think that announcement I think there was another motive there. They had another motive, you know. You and I both read Sun Tzu and the Art of War. Yeah, right. Yeah. They, I think there was something else strategically going on with that announcement because okay. I think they're a long ways away. They, they were spending a lot of time and energy with a company called Rockley over the last two or three years, and they were, Rockley was using photonics. Uh, they were using Raymond spectroscopy, and we think you get under the covers with the an Apple thing. We, I, I think they're, um, they've got they've got issues, and uh, I, th I think it's going to take quite a bit of time. Uh, so I think that announcement had some strategic import about which I don't know, okay. but because I, I think there's no there there right now. I think yeah. it's way out. Okay. It's way out in the future. I mean, that just... It's like my, Elon uh, announcing that he's going to make driverless cars by 2018, and now he's facing probably recalls across the entire spectrum for his cars that keep crashing when there's no one driving. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes, you know, you can make an announcement like that as a blocking move, right? Yeah. It can be a block. Well, we're going to be there, so you know you better not put any energy there because we're going to beat you and we're yeah. bigger. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I don't know. That's my sense of it. All right. Um, well, let's uh, let's talk about uh, the the white diamond thing. So you guys got your stock price got hit really hard when that came out. A lot of people looked yeah. at it, and and uh, uh, I'll, I'll give my little theory first, which is. Yeah, sure. I think this guy had shorted your company ahead of time, months, maybe years earlier. Realized that it, it it's not going to be a play that he can he can make anything on. So he released this this report, uh, which was just sort of like a bastardized uh, Wikipedia article, and uh, tried to drop the price so he could get out. And that's my that's my thought. Is they can get down to like 80, 80 cents, and he's like, I'm out. And because um, trying to hold long term, I don't think would work out. But that's yeah. my that's my opinion. Well, this is a subject about which Houston I work hard to be very judicious about. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I work hard to be very judicious about 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 all of this. Uh, we put out a press release after. Uh, that white the white diamond research report surfaced and we basically you know called it out for what we thought it was um which was a, a report from somebody who was you know hoping to profit by shorting our stock yeah and uh uh we we uh we we didn't want to grace the report or honor it if you will by responding point by point to yeah to a combination of lies, half-truths, and innuendos. Yep. And um, 
And so we didn't, and we haven't, and we won't. Um, the only thing I'd say there's something kind of, you know, one of the, it, you know, it's interesting. It, the the one thing that's quite apparent from the the author of the report is he didn't do any serious due diligence. As you said, yeah. it was kind of, bre- you know, a breezy, wick, you know, uh, half-baked Wikipedia. Uh, but, you know, it, uh, there, there are, we have filed in our K's and Q's and in our press releases a uh, uh, significant body of material information. I'd call it evidence, which refutes essentially everything he's said, yeah. right? But I, I don't like to, you know, I, I'm not interested in any kind of tit for tat yeah. and going through that. The one thing is kind of curious. I mean, I thought it was kind of humorous, his remark that we didn't have any MDs on staff. <laughs> uh, and and I and I, you know, the only thing I'd say is I've been in the tech business for forty years. Yeah. You know, software, hardware, building stuff, doing stuff, having ideas, and bringing things to market. And, uh, uh, you know, I I wouldn't gather together a group of MDs to be technologists necessarily. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's like now, obviously, as we go to market. We're going to have a lot of MDs involved in clinical testing, and we do have a chief medical officer who uh, uh, is an endocrinologist who was the uh, the man responsible for global clinical trials for diabetes therapeutics at Lilly for a dozen years, yeah. and and uh, he is personally responsible for three billion dollar diabetes therapeutics. So that's not chopped liver, yeah, right? yeah. And his name's Andy Anderson. Andy is kind of our senior father figure in a way. He's been around the block. And uh, when I first met Andy, and people have heard me tell this story, I said, he said, what are you doing? And we had a mutual acquaintance. And he said, well, we're in Seattle, and, and we, we have developed sensor technology that allows us to non-invasively ascertain blood glucose levels. And he said, oh, golly, at Lilly, I've seen 50 of those and none of them work. Yeah. So I said, hey, well, Dr. Anderson, how would you like to fly to Seattle and spend a day in our lab? And, you know, because his life's work is in, as an endocrinologist is around this whole area yeah. of diabetes. And so he he was intrigued. He flew to Seattle. He spent a, a day in the lab. He saw the he saw the. Our, our sensor then working, it was much bigger. It was more like a bread box. You know, it was yeah. big. We hadn't done the miniaturization stuff. And he saw it working. He saw the raw, he saw the raw results as compared to, at that point with somebody they were wearing a Dexcom. And he saw the raw results in the comparison of the Dexcom. And he said, hmm, yeah, yeah, you're doing it. I see yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> it's working. And, he's, and then he said, what can I do to help? And um, and I said, well, how would you like to guide us, advise us as we make our way through the lab, ultimately out into the world, third party validation, go to the FDA? And he said, I'd I'd love to, I'd love to. Yeah. So he's been our C, he's our, our chief medical officer and and actively engaged and involved. So he's an MD. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, uh, you know, with and a and a credible a credible man who's who you know had created. Three billion dollar annual rev diabetes therapeutics at Lilly, and there you have it. Yeah. So, um, any rate, I um, I see, you know, and I have to always assume that somebody that writes one of these short reports is going to listen to your podcast. Of course, he's <laughs> going to listen to your podcast. And so, you know, I um, everybody's got to do what they do to make a nickel, yeah. right? And uh, uh, what what I do, what I would say is, hey, why don't you fly to Seattle, sign an NDA, you know, yeah. proofs in the proofs in the pudding. We're here every day. We're an open book. Uh, there, I, there are any number of people who have come to Seattle and seen it. They can, I'm happy to show it to you. I'm happy to have you. I'm happy to have people sit and be tested in the yeah. chair, right? But you know, I it, the. Uh, because I want to, you know, I, I, I'm all about visibility and transparency kind of within, you know, the obligatory thing we have to do as a public company is we have to be careful about disclosure and 
you know, inside information. Yeah. And that's why I say NDA and whatever and, and all the rest. But no, you know, I, the, uh, I don't, begr- I don't begrudge a guy taking a swack at us to make a buck, but I, you know, uh, it, we, it, we don't, it, it doesn't cause us to miss our stride. We yeah. keep working it every day and we know what we're doing. We know what we have. And, uh, I mean, it seems like from reports, you got plenty of capital to keep doing your R and D. So you don't have to worry about yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. No, you know, we're all good there. And, and, uh, you know, we're, I've been doing, as you know, I've been doing this for a long time Yeah, being an entrepreneur and, and, uh, so yeah, we we know how to do it. So let's uh, let's dive about that. Um, so you're a lawyer by training, yeah, right. And so how 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 would how did you first get into sort of the tech entrepreneurship investment game as as a lawyer? Oh boy. Well, so let's kind of back up. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm a Washington State native, and I was living in Issaquah, and I was about six or seven years old, and. I had a garden and I was raising zucchini squash and uh, <laughs> I, I take my zucchini in my wagon and I take it down on front street in Issaquah. If you know Issaquah on front street, I take it down to Issaquah to front street to Tony and Johnny's market. And I, I sell him my zucchini and <laughs> I went in one day and I had more zucchini and, and, and Tony said, well, you know, he took me back in the vegetable area there at produce section. And he said, well, you know, um, I didn't sell any of your zucchini this week. <laughs> and I said, well, that's why you need to buy my fresh zucchini. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I've been an entrepreneur for a long time. Uh, <laughs> and I think I've always been kind of, you know, I'm, I've always been uh, pretty early into things. You know, it's sort of an early, you know, I, I like being early. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I, I uh, I was in, I got involved in the in the microcomputer industry really early. Uh, I had a, a software distribution company called CyberSoft, not a bad name, in 1979. Yeah. And then then uh, in '81, co-founded a database software company called MicroRim. It had a relational database, R base, uh, and that was pre PC. The the database uh, built by my brother, who's co-founder with me uh the database was built on a Heathkit cpm machine if you can believe it right and we ended up growing that up to number two market share in the world yeah. and uh a relational database that adhered to all the laws of relationality of dr ef cod the the architect if you will of relationality and uh and then got involved in uh uh I was one of the original investors in a in a company called Egghead, Egghead Discount Software. Yeah, and, I know and, it. Yeah, and we grew that up to be uh, 210 stores in America in the 80s. Yeah, um, I got. I think I got, I got my first. Can't remember my hard drive or my first video card I bought from them when I built my first yeah. PC. But yeah. Well, you know what? A lot of people uh, uh, may be listening on this on this this broadcast to yours, Houston. Uh, don't know, don't remember, didn't experience the time when you would get. Uh, get a computer and had no software on it. Yep. Right. And so you had to go someplace and get your software. And there were software stores. There was Egghead. There was Software, etc. There was Comp USA. There yep. was a, uh, a a lot of stores selling both hardware and and software. And so we had 210 stores, largest seller of software in the country. And we were just you know, because it was a point where there was choice. You know, you'd had yep. to you had a choice between let's say a half dozen or more word processing packages or yeah, you had Corel, you had Word, you had yeah. yeah. Oh, Word, Word we Perfect, had Word, yeah. Word Perfect, yeah. Word Star, Word yeah. Star, Word Perfect, etc. You know, that this was all pre-Word. Yeah, and but then of course, uh, what I like to say is that Microsoft won the software wars, and everything came preloaded, and and Egghead, of course, went away. I'd spent a couple of years as a senior exec there when we, you know, were really rocking and rolling it, and uh, but then I've gone on to found and co-found any number of other companies and i'm a founder here at no labs yep. and uh, i've been been working on this really pretty assiduously now for you know well over a decade and uh uh and you know got the bit in my teeth and excited about this and i love the process i really love the the entrepreneurial process of bringing a concept to reality yeah. kind of getting people gathering people together around a concept um not just your employees, but you know all your stakeholders and investors and all the rest. And and uh, I, I 
in in my view, it's like an art form. I call yeah. it in many respects sophisticated adult play. You know, this the idea that you could imagine doing something and and um, and and then build something that can make a difference in the world. Yeah. I've also, you know, always takes the same energy to do a big deal as a little deal. So <laughs> you know, you might as well imagine something big. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So no, I, I love it. I love what I do every day, and I love the whole process of of entrepreneurship and building a team and making a difference. Yeah. Well, um, so uh, uh, no lab before before no labs became no labs. You were vigilant. Yeah, we're vigilant. Yeah. Well, let me let me tell you how that how, what happened there. When we first started out, I mean, sort of the evolution of it. What happened? I mean, the, sort of the very beginnings. I had this idea. It, it, that really started around a conversation about the the vanity of human perception, right? Okay. And by that I mean, you and I have three color receptors: red, blue, and green, right? And we look out the window and we see what we see. Uh, a shrimp has seventeen color receptors. Yep. A bumblebee has thirty-two color receptors. In other words, there's more out there to be seen than we can see. Yeah. And we started, you know, talking about that, and and this is at a point when we're beginning to see off, uh, uh, off-the-shelf LEDs available, relatively inexpensive, and so we initially we put together a product and some technology that we called Chrome ID, and and in one of its ultimate form factors, it's like a mag light. It's like yep. this. This is it, and uh, uh, this has twelve LEDs in it, and. Uh, um, we had an earlier version that had 32 LEDs. So these the these emanate light in the uh, infrared, ultraviolet, and in the humanly visible portion of the spectrum. And we would use this to identify, authenticate, and diagnose based on the capacity to um, identify things that were humanly visible but outside the spectrum. Yeah. And one of the one of the things we do is kind of fun. I just I call it a parlor trick. I would have a half dozen vodkas and I'd take the scanner and I could tell which one was Kettle One, which one was Smirnoff, which one was Stoli. It was kind of interesting hmm. because people would say, well, is that a big deal? Counterfeit spirits. I said, well, that's really not the point. The, it might be more important to know if the morphine had been diluted in an IV drip. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or it might be more important to know if there was water and aviation jet fuel. Yeah. Right. So it could do a lot of things. Uh, we could identify the presence of E. coli on meat, for example. I mean, a lot of very interesting applications. But there again, it's a platform technology. And so what we were, the thing, as I said earlier, you're, you're sort of, in a way, you're bedeviled by a platform. Like, so we, we, did, we needed to make a product. And, and uh, about that time, I said, we've got to have a product. I, I met Phil Boshua, who was with us for four years, very inventive. And, and I said, Phil, do you have some time? I'd like to have you spend some time with me. Let's try to figure out a product. And yeah. we'd always kind of dreamt about glucose. And uh, there were some areas that we played with, you know, could you use light and, and, and get glucose in the viscous part of your eye or maybe on some of the translucent part of your earlobe yeah. or some other areas? And, and so we, you know, had always kind of dreamt about that. And so... Phil started working with me and and in the lab and and using LEDs we discovered glucose, but with LEDs it's kind of imperfect. It's a little bit about what I was talking about about you know SpO two and oxygen yeah. because you got issues. You got issues. You got issues to deal with. And so we're uh, thinking about well, look at the way you know sort of physics works. The if we can find glucose with LEDs at 1650 nanometers, if we go further out on the electromagnetic spectrum, will we be able to find them? Because it's really every time you change a frequency with an LED, you need a new LED, yeah. right? And you yeah. got to, and, and they cost money and it's just sort of complex. But if you're using radio frequency and going further out in the spectrum, you, you just, just tune turn the it. dial. Yeah. You just, you just tune it. So we, we got some gear and, and we've, we found glucose here and then we just went out and started tuning it. Son of a gun, we were hitting glucose. Yeah. So this is what we were doing here was foundational. We then leveraged on top of that to move further out the spectrum and 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 do all the things that we can do with radio frequency spectroscopy and then 
first focus, of course, as I explained earlier, glucose. So that's kind of the, you know, how, how it all evolved. And, yeah. um, you know, a very natural, I mean, it's sort of, you know, as it was a natural evolutionary cycle. And, uh, and here we are today. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, uh, someone just wrote, can you describe the current team you've assembled? Jess English and Steve Kent are rock stars. This is from Jimbo Slice. <laughs> um, yeah, the, we, uh, Steve, Steve Kent, uh, came on as chief product officer and Steve has, has, uh, brought along some other Steve came from aura and aura is a sleep ring company. Okay. Right? Yeah, I know them. Yeah. And, and then, St uh, Steve has brought along, uh, three other people encouraged three other people from aura to come on board. Um, Connor, Nicole, and Jess, and and they they're just great, great additions. They're part of the team, and then in addition, we've got um, several other really strong members of the team. Uh, Leo Troutwine, Leo uh, came to us among other things that Leo's done. He was at Rivian, and um, then uh, uh, Pete Conley. Pete's a thirty-year. Uh, investment banker, been in capital markets. He's done a great job, and uh, 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 he also is SVP Intellectual Property, and he's been really guiding us as we build that strong IP portfolio. So, yeah. really, got a. I just couldn't be more pleased. Now, I want to add because in this it used to be when you build a business, Houston, that you know you'd build a big team. Yeah, right? you did it. You did it yourself. But in this day and age, you can bring on outside resources, you know, on a contract basis to work on a project. So we have really extraordinary external partners. Uh, our design, the people working on the form factor, the design is a group out of the Bay Area called Bold Design. Bold is really extraordinary. They've done work for Google and a lot of others. Mm -hmm. um, they're they're really fantastic. We've got a third party machine learning uh, group. Uh, they've been in town the last three of their members have been in town the last two days. I met with them yesterday. It's called Edge Impulse. Edge Impulse, the uh, they've got a, a a fabulous global team of people working on ML and AI and algorithms. So they're taking our raw data, working on our algorithms. They're fantastic. We've got a Seattle-based group working on, if you will, kind of the guts inside that thing that Bold Design is designing. Yeah. It's called e Igor, and and they've done work for a whole host of brand name people working on products. So we've got a really extraordinary team of both internal, external people, people expert in testing, people expert in terms of uh, working with the scientific community on validation, working with our data, working on publications, doing all the things you need to do yeah. as you amass your resources to go to the FDA. So, yeah. All right. Uh, uh, so uh, when did the name change from Vigilant to No Labs, and how did that come about? Because because you're no longer working well, in the visual spectrum. Well, yeah. So yeah. you know that's exactly right. Here we were. We were working with light. Yeah. And we we're working with it, it. If you think about, we were using light, and it was all about um, authentic. There was authentication and diagnostics, and you know identification, and so there was a visual aspect to it, yeah. and it was really a combo a combination of visual and vigilant, right? And um, as we started to move away from photonics, move into uh, into radio frequency spectroscopy, and I sort of expand the reach of the sensor technology, then we 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 started thinking. You know, we're gathering a lot of data. We're going to get to know a lot about what's going on in our bodies. Yeah. And you know, I just sort of it as we expanded the reach of what we were doing, it just naturally evolved. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's go to more more uh, questions from folks here. Um, Jimbo Slice also asks, "How close are you to having a working prototype?" Um. Uh, as I said earlier, I don't want to talk about timeline. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> but uh, wait, we're 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 working on having a working prototype. Okay. How's that? All right. I guess you know supply chain and all that stuff. Um, yeah. Lucky you live Hawaii. Uh, would you consider releasing a device as a wellness device without FDA approval? Example: Apple Watch, Fitbit type. 
Uh, and would you consider licensing your technology to Apple as a wellness device? Um, I think what I'd say about the, um, there's a certain rigor involved in a medical device. There's mm -hmm. rigor involved in a medical device. <laughs> and I, I have a tendency to call wellness devices, wellness gadgets. All right. And, um, so I want us to aim for that high bar yeah. that is medical device, <clears throat> right? I want to aim for that high bar. Yeah. Um, I think the, you get more respect in the market. Uh, you, you get a more, you know, you get better valuations in the market. Um, and we have a, we have a vision for the company that really has us do much, much more in the medical diagnostic realm, because you know, over time, got a list of about 100 analytes we think over time we could identify. We think over time with a core group of analytes, we can do medical diagnostics that uh, are really predictive, that we could say, you know, it looks, Houston, like you're trending towards something. Yeah. Right? And and so we think there's just a lot to be done in that area, and and we want to keep aiming for that high bar. Yeah. So that's that's really my answer. Okay. All right, let me see. Now, I... that's, not, that's not to say... <laughs> Not to say that, you know, biohackers could get a hold of what we have and it's got all kinds of wellness attributes to it. But yeah, yeah. No, that's, we're focused on med device. Okay, okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, Note Milkman. I refer to him as the most threatening name on the internet. Uh, my younger brother is diabetic and he's excited for a non-invasive glucose monitor because he hates using Dexcom because it hurts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that makes sense to me. Why, why would you want to, have to carry something plugged into your body around all over the place? And uh... yeah, well, I think yeah. And one of the things that we learn about people that have diabetes, you know, I mean, we can talk about the pain point about finger stick or sticking in it, but mm -hmm. but they've got, there's more than that. They have to always be on the clock. They've always got to be paying attention. Mm -hmm. And and I think that something that's non-invasive really is going to be, you know. M m make aspects of of their lives much easier yeah because so, I, mean, I mean i i picture you know you're constantly thinking like oh where are my blood sugar levels right now you know should i check now do i wait do i have to have a cookie do i have whatever but if you just have this thing it can if, even if it's, if it's like a wearable if it's something that continuously monitors then it can be like bloop bloop hey time to take a shot uh rather than like guessing the guesswork is kind of removed from there which i think reduces stress I think in the end. Oh, yeah. no, no doubt. No yeah. doubt. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, uh, let's just touch on like the VC world. Uh, so Silicon yeah, Valley well, Bank. SVB, I <laughs> yeah, know. Just uh, imploded, well, got seized by FDIC. Yeah, no, that was really, and that happened very, very fast. In one um, day. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I assume that, you know, there was a combination of things. They had some assets on their balance sheet mm -hmm. that had been deteriorating over time. Um, and um, they had some, you know, one assumes that they had on their, you know, some debt instruments that, uh, you know, began be because of their client base began to have some questionable attributes. And yeah. so, yeah, I mean, it's, but I, 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 I was surprised with the speed yeah. with which the wheels fell off. Um, and then, you know, there's some other things going on in that whole space now. You know, you're seeing uh, some limited partners <laughs> wanting to see capital returned. Yep. Uh, that capital that they've deployed to VC funds. And, um, yeah, I mean, we. I think – we went through some very heady days and SVB Silicon Valley bank went through some very heady days, you know, and if you kind of look at some of the valuations, I mean, all the unicorns and the crazy valuations, and they're really not, you know, they, they weren't grounded on anything that was sustainable and they didn't see, they, they bore little relationship to, excuse me, that people, things that had long-term value. And so I, um, I, you know, was this bound to happen? You know, I, it's nothing like a retrospectoscope. It, it, yeah. 
bound to happen. I mean, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm a huge fan of, of, uh, Charlie Munger's, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you and I were talking earlier about leverage and, yeah. you know, the leverage, the leverage that's been available in the marketplace to certain people. And, and, um, yeah, no, it's, you know, there's no substitute for fundamentals. Right? Yeah. No so substitute. how, as someone who's, 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 you know, been in the, in this VC space and been angel investor and all that stuff, how do you see the collapse of this bank, uh, sort of affecting future, uh, uh, venture capital? Well, in the ecosystem in which they exist, there are people that are going to have to lick their wounds a little bit. Yeah. Right. But, you know, here's the thing. I, I think that it will continue. I mean, we're a very entrepreneurial society. Yeah. Um, you know, you talk about the people say there's a liquidity crisis when, in fact, kind of the globe is a wash in capital. The globe yeah. is a wash in capital. One of the issues is that there, there are just not a lot of good homes for capital, right? People are risk averse, but there's a lot of capital out there. So I think quality deals will always get funded. Quality deals will always get funded. You're going to have valuations maybe that are not as stratospheric as they once were, yeah. but deals deals will get funded. And, uh, um, But I think that, you know, there were some, a lot of these folks flew a little too close to the sun, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, when you've got a when you've got a really blue chip firm like Sequoia putting a hundred million dollars into a Bahaman crypto deal with no due dilly. Yeah. Zero. <laughs> I mean, what's wrong with this picture? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, they deserve every. They, these guys need to get their hat handed to them. What so, are they thinking? I mean, you, are, if if you are Sequoia right now, I can be uh, SBF, and you'd be talking, and I'd be on my other monitor right here playing a video game, going, "Uh huh, uh huh, uh huh." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. unbelievable. And they're like, unbelievable gold. <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. I was I was reading um, uh, a tally someone had done of I think it was Grubhub or something, and they showed the. As Grubhub grows and as they charge freakishly more money for their services, their losses are mounting in ways that that are just uncomparable. And same thing's happening with Uber and Lyft and all these other ride shares is that, you know, these systems are no longer subsidized by the VC capital. Now they're trying to run on their own and they can't. <laughs> and I and I honestly can't figure out how or why. You don't have just some sort of system that you set up, and then it facilitates from there. You know, the scheduling and whatever. I I can't imagine how top heavy the administration has to be of those share services. Like I, it blows my mind how much money is just being drained. Yeah, you know. Well, we've been through this before. You know, I mean. Is this uh, the is this the dot com era? Yeah, Redux. Yeah, well, there's I mean, there's that... there's dot com back in the day. Remember that one? Yeah, yeah. yeah there was right. Uh, like you just call you. Just... Well, no, no. My lackey. My, my, lackey. my lackey is my, my lackey. Yeah, my lackey. Yeah, my, my lackey dot com. I know the two founders of my lackey. Yeah. right. And it was just and, you know you uh, call them up and like hey I need someone to like scrub a floor and they just send someone over and scrub <laughs> a floor and yeah I know I know and so you yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, I used them a couple of times to come yeah. over and, you know, take some crap to the dump or yeah. something, whatever. <laughs> so, but yeah, and so it's a little bit like the dot com redux. I mean, it's like 2.0 or yeah. whatever it is, or 3. Point or something. Yeah. But because they, yeah, just a lot of goofy stuff um, that not, not sustainable business models that are not sustainable. Oh, it's, and, it's uh, ridiculous. So, uh, during COVID, I, I sought Ron as a mentor. Uh, I had founded a company. We had the patent for uh, biodegradable m- melt-blown fibers, like the stuff that could be used in masks and gowns and whatnot, but be with biodegradable plastic. And uh, we were trying for months to just get a conversation with a VC. And no one, no one wanted to talk to us. We'd write, we'd email, we'd call, and they'd be like, oh, it sounds like a billion-dollar idea. Like, I know. It's right now it's a one hundred billion dollar business and we could take it over. And they're like, Yeah, but like your machines are really expensive and if we invest in a tech company, 
It's just some guy in front of a computer for six months for twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> it was it got to a point where we just couldn't get anyone to to talk. So, uh, and, it, and so it blows my mind that if we just been like facemaskcrypto.com, they probably would have <laughs> thrown well, piles of money at us. <laughs> well, well, yeah. Or now, if you uh, uh, you you add AI to it, yeah, right? yeah. Face mask so AI, yeah. Face, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, um, I think it's a, it's fair to say that the VC behavior on Sand Hill Road is they're they're really like lemmings, right? Yeah, they're like lemmings. And, oh yeah. You know, said, oh my God, I got to be. You know, hey, Sequoia's in that deal. We got a chance. Or uh, and and recent Horowitz, they're in the deal. Oh, it's got to be hot then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, here's you know. Um, yeah, it's not quite how it works. Right? <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Uh, it, and it, it, I worked for rivals.com way back in the day when they were a startup here in Seattle. And right. sure. I saw Downtown. firsthand, yeah, I saw the, fir- the first hand, just the ridiculousness of that, that bubble. And I was 19. I was making way too much money as a 19 year old doing it for them. I was his mm-hmm. junior systems network engineer. And uh, uh, my job was to basically, if someone got hired, they get me find them their office or the cubicle or whatever. I would hook up their computer, the network, get it ghosted to whatever systems they were supposed to be on. And then they would be ready to go. And then, you know, if there are problems. I'd do that stuff. Uh, they would hire people, but the office wasn't big enough to have any more people in the office. And the internet wasn't good enough for anyone to work remotely because it's 1999, 2000, 2001. And uh, uh, so there are like a thousand people on staff making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year who had nowhere to work. <laughs> and and uh, but, but but we were all guaranteed 30, two 30 minute massages a week. We had tons of parties. We had, like, and I would sit with my Palm Pilot in my office and just play Dope Wars on my phone because I had nothing to do, making way too much money. I, I think at the time I was making like $85 an hour and I had $3 million in stock options that, that had, not, had not vested yet. So I couldn't do anything about it. And three months away from vesting, we show up to work and there's just padlocks on the door and the company didn't exist anymore because they had spent it all on like cruises and company vacations and 30 minute massages for every employee it was just a wild time like how much money just disappeared in that well yeah and i think it's that that's a problem when you know the massive amounts we we're talking earlier about the massive amounts of capital in the world yeah. we're always looking for looking for a place to looking for a home looking for a safe haven and uh so a lot of these companies have been funded with way too much money. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, so it's no internal rigor. Yeah. And then, and then I think people began to have expectations about, you know, all those fringe benefits that were. Yeah. If you wanted the best engineer, of, you had to like, you had to give them those massages. You had to make it look so much cooler than whatever. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think we're going to, you know, I think what's, you know, what's going on now. I mean, I think, you know, we, you know, clearly there, there's some, there are some layoffs and, and, uh, all, you know, it's interesting. There are layoffs in the face of, we really have a full economy. I mean, we have full, yeah. in essence, full, full employment. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, we're going to, we're going through a disruptive time. Some of us are old enough to remember inflation in, uh, you know, 1979, 1980, when it hit 22%. Yeah. I don't, we're not, you know, we got our hand in the tiller a little bit better now. I don't think we're going to see that kind of thing. I don't, nothing quite like that. But, you know, we, we are suffering dislocation. And, you know, there are all these other things going on. And, you know, you and I see it. We go to downtown Seattle and we see storefronts that are empty. And that's something that you see all across the country. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think it'll take a while for the revitalization to happen. Yeah. I think we're, you know, the other thing we're going to see is, you know, every young lawyer doesn't need to have his own office anymore. We're not going to see those high rises filled with people in their own little offices. You yeah. know, they don't need to have that same kind of space, a lot more remote work. And uh, yeah, commercial think, real estate definitely is a void right now. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
read an article. San Francisco has 27 million square feet of office space is empty, which is 30% of all their office buildings. That's and, a big deal. Yeah. And, and prior to COVID, it was a 4% vacancy. So, yeah. you know, so there's, there's going to be a lot of capital that just sort of disappears as a result of those. those well, I, th- I think filled. one of the things I, 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 th- I think a number of the, what, one of the things we have to do, we have a, we have, we're short, what, three or four million housing units in yeah. America. And I think that uh, what we can do is we can enhance population in urban centers by repurposing some of these buildings. Yeah. Now that's non, that's non-trivial, but I think there, there are great opportunities to repurpose some of these buildings that are never going to be office buildings again, yep. and, but they can become residential. And as that happens, you're going to see more of those storefronts open back up yeah. and more, be- more, vita- more vitality at street level. I was right? just talking about this, my last show, uh, uh, Calgary, so far in North America, the only one I've read that successfully really started doing that, and they had converted like 8 million square feet of office space into into residences and brought a whole bunch of more people into their downtown core. And as a result, restaurants, clubs, you know, yeah. mini marts, whatever, are, are, are hustling and bustling. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So in Seattle, Seattle itself, uh, just in building residential towers, um, in the last six years have built more space downtown than they had in the previous 50 for residences and that's, wow amazing yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't know that yeah. so it's you know but then again like amazon is their campus is shrinking and <laughs> you know what's yeah. what's that going to mean yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah no it's uh well it's a very exciting time yeah never a dull moment that's for sure no that's yeah, yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. uh Anyone else in the chat here have anything cool to ask Ron before I, I make it, let him like enjoy his weekend? Um, but do, 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 do. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity, Houston. Great oh, to see you. Nice to see you, too. Yeah. yeah, man. Should... Great to see you. And uh, s- uh, send uh, send Alexis a note and congratulate her I, on, I will. On, on Owen, I know. which is a big It's fantastic. Very exciting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jimbo Slice again. Once the glucose monitor gets FDA approval, what other uh, analytes are you interested in exploring? Monitoring THC levels would be a game changer for public safety. It's like people driving on the influence of of that. Well, having to do yeah, no, I, and... uh, yeah, no, that's kind of interesting. I mean, that you know, tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, you know, alcohol, etc. I mean, I I could envision sensor technology that acts as kind of an ignition lock if you will in yeah. other words you could sense that a person shouldn't be operating the vehicle because the, you know you've detected grab the steering wheel or whatever and yeah yeah i mean i think that's all plausible uh so yeah but i i think that uh you know i mentioned earlier that we could uh ascertain the arrival of aspirin or tylenol in your bloodstream if you yeah. ingested it and I said that was a proxy for the therapeutics. I mentioned your grandmother. Yeah. Did she take her meds? But it's also, you know, is somebody has somebody taken Ill, an illicit substance yeah. or a substance that was impairing their capacity? So all of that is possible as yeah. well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and, and the work that I wanted to do, if I was going to actually get to do that PhD, well, essentially was would be using that text sort of as an assay of rock. Uh, in in, in yeah. knowledge speaking, so and rather than having yeah. to like grind up the rock, put it into his mass spectrometer, figure out what the parts per million are, you could just point this thing at it and it would tell you, oh, there's this much gold parts per million in this vein here. Uh, yeah. That's sort, sort of how I envisioned it. Well, well, you know, it's interesting. So, you know, we've been talking about analytes molecules in the human body, but our capacity to ask during the presence of something, a molecule. Yeah. It wouldn't necessarily have to be in the human body. Right? Yeah. I mean, that, and then, you know, Houston was obviously, you know, you were historically interested in that. Yeah. It's like a tricorder device. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's like, you know, here, yeah. let's say, let's, yeah. let's check you out. Boop, yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, lucky you live in Hawaii. Uh, the stock price has been dro- dipping below a dollar. What's your thought on requirement for the average must be above a dollar before being delisted? They got um, ninety days. Got 90, ninety days. days. Okay. Yeah. And and 
you know, I'm sure you have some plan. I don't know. <laughs> to, well, I think, know. I think, you know, you make announcements over time and, and, uh, you know, we're, we're subject to the macro forces of the market as well. Yeah. I mean, I think the market has generally been down, down, yeah. down. It's not been good. And so, you know, we're subject to that. Um, and then we've had, you know, pressure from shorts, but as we make announcements, we continue to do what we're doing. I, I am optimistic that the stock price will, will elevate over time. It, it should. It should. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Uh, let me just do a quick scroll, see if there's anything other uh, big questions fo folks have for us. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, there's people talking about banks in here, all sorts of banks. All sorts of, looks like all sorts of regional banks are just getting hammered at the moment. Um, yeah. I think that's, which bank will we sacrifice to the gods next? <laughs> uh yeah all right well cool that that was fun all right thank you ron well thank you houston a real pleasure and yeah. uh you know and uh, um look forward to seeing you around town as yeah. they say and, yeah and and, and uh, one of these days i do want to go to pacific raceways i have not never made it over there and, oh we'll uh, go yeah we go out yeah. there and, and and do the gearhead thing yeah all right <laughs> okay man all right Thanks thank you ron so much see ya all the best bye-bye <laughs> All right.